Well, the biggest misconception is that science is ever settled. I think the public has that to their to their you know uh, to their dismay because believing that science is settled is antithetical to science. Think about it, Dave. Mm -hmm. If if uh, Galileo came along and said, "Well, Aristotle was a scientist. He's very smart. Uh, I'll just accept (laughs) that there are only four elements instead of you know 114, or that heavy things fall faster than light things. All these things he could have verified, by the way, but he didn't actually go and do that. Uh, But Galileo would never have come up with the laws of uh, initial laws of relativity. Same with Newton, Einstein, because, well, Newton is a a genius. I can't outdo Newton as he often looked up to him. So therefore, as Richard Feynman, the great Nobel laureate of the 20th century said, science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. Otherwise, Hmm. you'd have no motivation to ever modify, refine and improve upon who or what came before you. Dave Rubin, and joining me today is a distinguished professor of physics at the Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences at UC San Diego, and author of the new book, Into the Impossible, Think Like a Nobel Prize winner, Brian Keating. Finally, welcome to the Rubin Report. Thank you, Dave. You were my first big guest on my podcast, so it's, it's nice to return the favor. I know you've been looking forward to having a big guest like me on for a while. (laughs) <laughs> I've wanted a man of science on for quite some time. And, no, I've, I've wanted to talk to you for a while on the show because I think this will be a little bit different than the shows that, that we normally do. But framing one thing sort of politically just to jump us off, as a man of science and as a man that just wrote a book about how scientists approach science, what do you make of the state of science at the moment. Science is getting pretty banged up these days. Yeah, it's it's tough. You know, I used to say I enjoy being an astronomer because there's no Republican asteroids, there's no Democratic comets, uh, there's no, you know, it's apolitical, but it's become incredibly politicized, as you point out. Uh, I always point out, Dave, you know, the word science in Latin, I know you're a scholar, so you'll know this. The word science means knowledge. It doesn't mean wisdom. So to expect wisdom from people that are knowledge, you know, junkies, uh, Wikipedia has a lot of knowledge, doesn't have any wisdom. You wouldn't want it to trust your dog with it, right? So I, I do believe that we're living in, an, in a fundamentally uh, scientific technological age that kind of is worshiping scientists way more Mm -hmm. than I think we warrant. Um, As anyone who's ever known uh, the famous joke about scientists, how do you know a scientist is outgoing? Because he looks at your shoes when he talks to you. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, you know, it's, 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 Part of the goal of this book is to is to humanize scientists and to to you know recognize that we're just human beings. We have no special you know truth claims or wisdom claims than anyone else. Does that sort of chasm between knowledge and wisdom sort of capture exactly the moment we're at in a way where it's like we hear things every day in the news? Okay, there's a new study that says something that tells us something about knowledge to some degree. But then the wisdom of the policies that then we are told we have to follow often seems a little screwy, at least in my humble opinion. Yeah, looking again, you know, if you look to somebody uh, for wisdom, when you know, again, looking for to Wikipedia for wisdom is, is not going to be too fruitful. Uh, and yet we crave it because we worship at the altar of science in some way justifiably so. It's led to life, uh, you know, increases, uh, child uh, mortality rates plummeting, vaccines uh, and so forth that are just miraculous and, and any other way would be difficult to describe it. Understanding the composition, evolution, uh, of the universe, you know, to to a fraction of a percent, just astonishing. And yet, we don't, as a laity, as the lay pe- person, don't really have a good understanding of how science works. So, as the words of Arthur C. Clarke say, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, and some say it could be indistinguishable from a god. And so, I think there is a tendency, a desire to worship at the altar of science. And I think that's misplaced because we don't elect scientists uh, as, as a population. We elect politicians, a president, uh, governors, et cetera. We elect those people and they wanna pass off, I think some of their responsibility to the scientists who we don't elect and we wouldn't elect a, in any other capacity. So last part on this specifically, but do you sense that sort of the reputation that science and scientists have gotten over the last year where it's been so sort of battered and inconsistent and wear masks, don't wear masks, it's, the vax is working, it's not working, booster shots, the whole thing. Do you think it can recover in the next couple of years? Because right now when they just trot out the next study, like at this point, I'm just like, ah, this is just, just more nonsense. I'm not saying I don't 
believe that the study was conducted, but what it will always lead to is just like, I can't listen to this stuff anymore. Well, the mo biggest misconception is that science is ever settled. I think the public has that to their to their you know uh, to their dismay because believing that science is settled is antithetical to science. Think about it, Dave. Mm -hmm. If if uh, Galileo came along and said, "Well, Aristotle was a scientist. He's very smart. Uh, I'll just accept <laughs> that there are only four elements instead of you know 114, or that heavy things fall faster than light things. All these things he could have verified, by the way, but he didn't actually go out and do that. Uh, but Galileo would never have come up with the laws of uh, initial laws of relativity. Same with Newton, Einstein, because, well, Newton is a, is a genius. I can't outdo Newton as he often looked up to him. So therefore, as Richard Feynman, the great Nobel laureate of the 20th century said, science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. Otherwise, hmm. you'd have no motivation to ever modify, refine, and improve upon who or what came before you. So I, I view that, uh, and, and I view it to the, to the detriment of science and scientists themselves. You know, often people say, oh, I'm no Einstein, I can't understand it. Well, guess what, Dave? Einstein wasn't Einstein, <laughs> you know, in the beginning of his life. So I think the more that we kind of venerate without explaining how science is actually done, it harms our own practitioners of the craft of science that I, I am engaged in. Yeah, and that really actually is what the book is about because you talk about things like creativity and human expression and passion, all of these things that we don't really associate with scientists and their work specifically. So let's just dive in. So you have nine chapters here, each one going off a different scientist for a different reason. I thought we could just spend a couple minutes on everybody, uh, but you gotta leave some secrets here, otherwise That's people right. won't buy the book. So a couple <laughs> minutes on everybody, I, I know how it works. Chapter one is about Adam Reese. The Stargazer. Yeah. So Adam is a contemporary of mine. He's basically my age. And back in, uh, I think it was 2005, there was a worldwide competition to determine uh, who was the greatest, you know, scientist under the age of 40. And he and I entered it. I came in first as the most promising scientist of all time, uh, at least of that age. And then Adam came in third. Uh, and so uh, later, you know, six years later, when he no won the Nobel Prize, my, my older brother, Kevin, who watches the show, uh, he called to report on me and said, Brian, you won the battle. But Adam won the <laughs> war, brother. You you <laughs> you had the temporary reprieve. So Adam is um, is an incredibly curious uh, individual. He's very young, and what is often said about the Nobel Prize, in fact, by Nobel laureate T. S. Eliot, who won it for literature, he said the Nobel is a ticket to your own funeral because no one ever does it after he wins it. And Adam mm. is a real counter example to that canard because he has gone on to, you know, great heights astronomically and otherwise, uh, educational, mentorship, et cetera. I think he best exemplifies the fact that, you know, Dave, I never thought I could be a professional astronomer. You know, growing up as we did on Long Island, uh, you know, I, I thought like, oh, someone's going to pay me to be an astronomer like they're going to pay me to be an ice cream taster or, you know, or a wizard or something like that. So I really do look at him as the fulfillment of this dream that you can do it. Uh, you can achieve your your passion, but passion alone is not enough. You need to have insatiable curiosity. I say passion is a spark but the fuel is actually curiosity. If you're looking for more honest and thoughtful conversations about academia instead of nonstop yelling, check out our academia playlist. And if you wanna watch full interviews on a variety of topics, check out our full episode playlist. They're all right over here. And to get notified of all future videos, be sure to subscribe and click the notification bell.